Shane Meal. There are few names out there that can even come close to the level of wasted potential Shane Meal had in racing. You probably already know the main story on Meal, how he got popped for testing positive for weed twice, got banned for life from NASCAR, and when it seemed he had finally turned his life around, became paralyzed from the waist down racing USAC. All of the above being said, Shane Meal wasn't an entirely lost cause. When he was racing in the world of NASCAR, there were clear glimmers of raw talent that would show through his over-aggressive and sometimes erratic driving style. But there was no race that displayed that raw talent and wasted potential more than the 2003 Indianapolis Raceway Park Bush Grand National event. This is Shane Meals, one that got away. Shane Meal joined George Debedark's Innovative Motorsports at the ripe young age of 21, competing in all 34 Bush Series races in his 2002 rookie campaign. It was a pretty standard rookie season where Meal picked up two poles on the season and led 61 laps on his way to finishing fourth in the New Hampshire event that year. 2003, on the other hand, wasn't really remarkable until race 22 at IRP. His best finish on the year so far had been back-to-back -back third place finishes at Texas and Talladega, but with only 12 total laps led thus far on the season, there wasn't really very much to be excited about. Especially with team sponsor Gold's Pumps scaling back their involvement with the team. Despite all that adversity, Shane put his flat white number 48 on the pole for the IRP race, beating out at the time second in points David Green and eventual season champion Brian Vickers for the top qualifying spot. It was a good start to the weekend, but still 200 laps lied ahead for the field of 43 cars, and at a track like this one, tides could change on any given lap. The 2003 Kroger 200 presented by Tom Raper RV was broadcast on TNT with color commentary from Alan Beswick, Benny Parsons, and Elliot Sadler. A heavy emphasis was given to the tight points battle, which saw PPC driver Scott Riggs holding onto a two-point gap over Bruco's David Green, as well as only 50 points over both Jason Keller and Ron Hornaday. Another point the broadcasters tried to drive home was an apparent feud between Bobby Hamilton Jr. and Mike Bliss, of all people, who were involved in incidents the previous two consecutive weeks at New Hampshire and Pikes Peak. Those two came into this event 6th and 11th in the points, respectively. When the starting lineup flashed on the screen, Bestwick made note that Neil would start in the outside lane when the race would eventually come to green. This was before double file starts were the norm, and the bottom lane tended to be a preferred lane on start. Gene Albert Jr. had two L's in his last name in the lineup graphic, while his racing reference page lists him with only one. This is the only race Gene Albert is listed as entering on all of racing reference. Shane Meal brought the Bush Grand National Field to the line to begin the 2003 Kroger 200 and David Green spun his tires heavily in the bottom lane, bottling up the field and allowing the empty hooded 48 to easily clear for the lead. The field quickly sorted itself out single file, rolling in the customary IRP top middle lane. There were several strange names in strange places during this race. Kyle Busch was driving the Ditec 87, officially a Hendrick Motorsports entry despite the usage of Nemco's owner points. Busch's previous race was his debut at Charlotte, where he finished second under caution to Matt Kenseth. Mike Skinner was driving the Kleenex No. 7, a car that had been driven by Randy LaJoy up until race 17 of the year. It would be Mike Skinner's only Busch start of the year and his last until 2006. Another strange name in a strange car encountered a race-altering issue on lap 20. Just as David Green had caught Shane Meal in traffic, Joey Clanton overdrove turn three and took out Martin Truex Jr., who was running the number 58. 
The 47 of Stacy Compton was also involved in the incident. Truex went on to finish the race three laps down in 21st. Meanwhile, Clanton was unable to finish any more laps. This race was the first time in my life I ever saw what Joey Clanton looked like. None of the lead lap cars pit during this caution period until Bobby Hamilton Jr. went up in smoke on the one to go lap. The Renzi team fought hard but were unable to finish the race and went behind the wall finishing in 35th. When the race finally got back to green, David Green had a much better restart and hung on Emil's rear end for most of the run. The nature of IRP made it difficult to pass on the bottom of the track and Neil was able to hang on to the lead using the strength of the outside line. Brian Vickers challenging Green for that second spot certainly didn't help the 37's cause either. Laps continued ticking away and the most exciting thing that happened during the stint was the 73 of Jason Schuler losing his track bar. Schuler's best bush finish was 13th earlier that year at Nashville. And while he really didn't go on to amount to anything, he did manage to grab three NASCAR Midwest Series wins during his short time in NASCAR. Brian Vickers and Jason Keller appeared to be the cars to beat as they were able to make passes in places no one else could go or were willing to go. Vickers finally completed the pass for second around lap 58, but Meal had already driven off to a 1.5 second lead over the field. A 200 lap race at IRP is just as short as it sounds and the broadcast team were already speculating on some cars that had already made their final stop of the day. Tires were important though as Stacy Compton drove around his competition like they were standing still on fresh tires after his spin. After coming back from commercials, Vickers was all over Meal for the lead. However, it seemed that even with traffic, Meal could still hang on to the lead just fine over the fully funded Hendrick 5 car. The power in the 48 car was expanded on in this short aside by Mark Guerra. Well, Benny, the 48, that is a brand new car. They decided after Milwaukee they needed something better for the short tracks, and Steve and uh, Shane talked them into building a drop snout car. They finished it on Wednesday, took it to Greenville Pickens on Thursday in South Carolina, ran about 30 laps. Shane said, I really love the way this car pivots in the corner, and they were good to go. They brought it here, and obviously it's an improved piece over what they had in Milwaukee. Around this time, Neil lapped the 29 of Marty Lindley, who is the son of Bush Lindley. The car was prepared by RCR. It was the only Bush race Lindley ever competed in. Coming back from another commercial, a fun fact posed by the broadcast was that three of the last five IRP winners went on to win the championship that same year. Interesting. Another interesting factoid is that this race was run during the heated racing back to the line controversies that were swirling around the garage. Bestwick asked Sadler for an opinion on the matter that really set the tone on which direction NASCAR was planning on going with that issue. I'm like Alan, not much <laughs> gentleman stuff going on on the racetracks here the last few months in racing. It's been a lot of hard racing back to the line. But what do you think about that? I think we need to do something about it. I mean, gentleman agreements were made with, uh, you know, Daryl Walter, Kelly Yarbrough, and people like that. Uh, back then, when, when you always try to give the guys a break if they wreck, to, to get the crews, the firemen out to the drivers. I wish NASCAR, you know, they're trying to work on it, but until they can get something that's 100% uh, foolproof as far as freezing the field when the caution comes out I think all the drivers would be better off we want to when we see one of our peers getting a wreck we want to see the fire and safety get to them as quick as we can so hopefully something in the near future will happen with that something flipped right around lap 95 as Brian Vickers began hounding the 48 car harder than he had earlier in the race he tried using every square inch of the track to find his way around Neil but nothing Vickers could do helped him get around this fight allowed third place David Green to close, and soon enough it was a three-way battle for the lead at IRP. Vickers was able to get under Meal, but could never complete the pass. It wasn't until lap 107 where the lapped 77 of Dana White, no, not that Dana White, got in Meal's way and Vickers completed the pass and began to drive off. More action took place under commercial. Cars were already on pit road under the yellow when the broadcast came back on. Ron Hornaday won the race off pit road taking two tires, David Green lost several spots, and Vickers just managed to get out ahead of Meal for second. The caution was on none other than the 77 of Dana White, who got turned by the one of David Stremme for being slow. Hornaday's lead didn't last very long, as Vickers brought his five car back out to the lead with Shane Meal following into second just a few laps after the restart. 
Advil paid for a returning from commercial spot due to the likelihood that anyone who was going to be forced to watch the Brickyard 400 the next day would need some to get through it. Before Bestwick could even finish setting the scene for the battle between Vickers and Meal, Kyle Busch wiped out two-time Cup Series champion Ashton Lewis, bringing out the caution for the third time of the day. Bush and Lewis finished 33rd and 34th respectively. This race also happens to be the first time I ever saw what Ashton Lewis looked like. Scott Riggs, the points leader coming into this race, had spent the whole day outside the top 10 and began to try and experiment with trying to get a good finish by pitting under this caution. Shane Meal got an excellent jump on the lap 133 restart, allowing him to jump to the inside of the five and begin his challenge for the lead. The two battled side by side for a lap before Meal cleared himself across Vickers' nose. Meal had already proven his car was good enough to lead on the short run, but he still had over 60 more laps to fight to keep that lead. The battle ranged on, even after coming back from commercials with just over 50 laps remaining in the 2003 Kroger 200. Lap traffic loomed out the 48's windshield, all the while Vickers was right there on his bumper. The lap cars generally rolled the bottom of the track when the leaders were driving up on them, but it was still a challenge for Meal to hold on to the lead. After yet another commercial break, the broadcast nearly missed a pass for the lead as Vickers finally managed to get a nose under Meal. At this time, Vickers was still trying to look for his first Bush Series win. Meal had a huge advantage on the outside, but Vickers was finally able to do something he hadn't been able to do all day. Before, Meal would just drive off and clear the five off the top line. But now, after the sun had set beyond the horizon, Vickers was able to hang onto the 48's quarter panel off the corners, making it easier to match lap times. With 31 to go, Vickers made contact with Meal while trying to navigate around the lap 16 of Larry Gunzelman, and it was enough for Meal to shake off the five for a few laps. But Vickers drove right back onto the rear end of the 48. This battle was enough to bring third place Jason Keller into the conversation for the lead. With 28 to go, Meal overdrove turn one trying to get under the lap 52 of Brad Teague, but nearly ran him over instead, slowing Meal down enough for Vickers to jump back to his inside. It wasn't enough though, and Meal once again cleared for the lead. The battle raged on, eventually bringing the 23 of Scott Wimmer into the conversation. It was soon a four-way battle for the lead with under 25 to go at IRP. Finally, another challenge for the lead came from Vickers. Neil held his line on the outside, giving him all the run he needed to keep the 48 out front. But corner after corner, lap after lap, Vickers came closer and closer to clearing Meal until he finally did it out of turn two on lap 181, and the five was finally able to drive off with the race lead. Not even a lap later, Vickers had a half straightaway lead on Meal, and Meal had a Scott Wimmer to his inside. Vickers continued driving off, and after yet another commercial break, Jason Keller had found his way around Wimmer and was looking for second for Meal. Keller cleared the 48, but Meal drove back into the 57 from the momentum on the outside. Keller drove off for Meal and did appear to be closing on Vickers for the lead, but laps were running out. Wimmer got back to the inside of Meal, but still couldn't clear. It was beginning to look a lot like Meal's battle with Vickers with a much less exciting prize for the victor. Coming to the white flag, Wimmer drove as deep as he could into turn three and wiped himself out along with Shane Meal. Wimmer had the worst end of the wreck, ultimately finishing 12th. Meanwhile, Brian Vickers came to the checkered flag to take his first career Bush Series win at IRP. Shane Meal got his car going in the right direction and crossed the line in fourth behind Jason Keller and Stacy Compton. Scott Riggs finished one spot ahead of David Green, and despite all the struggles the 10 car had in the event, Riggs came out of the race with a bigger points lead than he had when he came in. Shane, I'm gonna ask you the same question you asked me a second ago. That was racing, wasn't it? Yeah, any, anything like that's racing, but um, you know, in between, I mean, I've never, uh, last time I raced that hard, I couldn't remember when. Uh, we run 50 laps side by side, me and Brian Vickers in the lead that many laps. My team did a heck of a job to get me out of the pits in second like they did. And I mean, it was just a really good day for us, man. I'm tickled to death to run fourth. We'd have run third, but me and Scott Wimmer got together two to go just on a short track racing incident. He's a he's a racer that don't do that, and I'm a racer that tries not to do that. And, uh, you know, good for us. Good top five finish. You can't be disappointed. How frustrated, though, is it to lead that many laps and not be sitting over in victory lane where Brian Vickers is right now? 
Uh, not as frustrating or disappointing as it is four times he should have won this year. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you can't be disappointed with that. I come to race, you know, and, and good racing is what I like. And I, I'll win one one day. I'm 23 years old. But he's only 19, so think of how good he's going to be. But either way, uh, when I'm 40, I, I'll have a couple of wins. But I'm just looking forward to it. I just enjoy racing, and that was racing to me. It don't matter if the fourth or I raced my guts out, and my team did the best job they could do for me. We just got a little tight, and we'll be back next week. Shane Meal would finish fourth again at Bristol two races later, but with no laps led. Four races after the 2003 Kroger 200, Meal filled his first drug test and was immediately suspended from NASCAR, unable to compete in another event in 2003. 2004 played out significantly more different, as Shane dropped down to a full season in the truck series, and he actually picked up the first ever win for Billy Ballou driving around Todd Bodine at Las Vegas with two laps to go. The comeback tour was short-lived though, and Meal tested positive again in 2005 and was ultimately banned from NASCAR for life. Meal went to rehab in 2007 and seemingly came out a changed man. Unfortunately, he was unable to clear his reputation as he was paralyzed from the waist down after a qualifying wreck driving a USAC Silver Crown in 2010. Shane Meal has had a tumultuous light in and out of racing. And while he may have that one truck win to bring home with him, the 2003 Kroger 200 at Indianapolis Raceway Park will always be the one that got away.